To some, transhumanism sounds wonderful. A life where we can live merged with technology. A life where we are not bound to this earth by disease, by hunger. Our consciousness may even be uploaded to the cloud and we can live forever. The divine will be separated from humans and we will no longer have our natural self. And we should take whatever steps we can to preserve the light of consciousness. And the window, the window has been open. Only now, after four and a half billion years, is that window open. That's, that's a long time to wait. And it might not stay open for long. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Greetings. In the name, the perfect, exalted name, the very name that causes demons to tremble, the exalted, perfect, holy name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to another End Times for the Believers. Bible Prophecy Update. The universal question that is being asked today by both believers and non-believers alike is this. Are we living in the days the Bible prophesied of that are referred to as the last days? From this point of view, absolutely, without controversy, these are the last days. And, and still there are those who may say, they've been saying that for 2,000 years now. Christians have been holding to the fact that we are living in the last days for some 2,000 years. And in fact, they are correct in that statement. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, note there, in these last days, spoke unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And so according to Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the church, the New Testament church from the days of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and specifically from the day of Pentecost has been living in the last days. But the apostles came to Jesus and they asked of him in more specific terms, not only would we be soon living in the last days, but they asked in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, what would be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And his response affectionately we refer to as the Olivet Discourse. Would you pray with me for a moment, please? Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. We want to thank you, each one of us, that we have your word and that indeed it is a light into our path. It gives us understanding at a time in world history where everything seems to be backward, when everything seems to be turned upside down, when evil is called good and good is called evil. Oh Lord, how we most sincerely desire this day, your word, to receive it from you to our hearts. Help me, dear Father, to speak the word that you have placed upon my heart for what I believe is to be the very clear purpose of encouraging the saints. And though some of the things we share are hard and may be troubling in their own respect, they point to an awesome truth that indeed we are living in the last of the last days and we are looking upward. And so, Lord, may you encourage the hearts of everyone that listens this day to this message 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Again, he gave to them, his disciples, in the Olivet Discourse, various different specific signs so that the last generation, the terminal generation, the generation that would be living in the times just before the raising up of Antichrist and ultimately the second coming, that we would be most assured by virtue of those signs. But what we did not realize at the time, and only now perhaps more so in the last couple of years, is how man himself would be intertwined with the development of those signs. How that the arm of flesh would somehow be intimately involved with the fulfillment of those signs that the Lord Jesus gave us that would tell us for certain we are living in the last days. For example, pestilence, one of the great signs that the Lord Jesus gave us so that we might identify the period of church history we are in is pestilence or what we now recognize as a pandemic. Or more specifically, might I say, who in the world who has any basic understanding of what is going on in the world would not deny that man's hand has been very much involved with the pandemic, with the virus, and that is understood on what we have been recognizing as a gain of function. Another one of those specific signs would be famines. And though there are famines that are beginning to ravage third world countries because of what's taking place, we are seeing the signs that there will soon be serious food shortages. And once again, we cannot help but to see the hand of man through the social engineering of society. And then there was another sign that the Lord Jesus gave, but he gave it through his apostle John in the book of Revelation and also through his prophet Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 15 through 25, for example, as well as in Revelation 17, he gave us a very specific sign regarding the 10 kings that would be visible and emerging just prior to the revealing of the Antichrist. And what we have learned in the last period of time is regarding these kings, if you will, that they are not like the kings most of us had anticipated would emerge in the last days. We anticipated, I know I did, Kings that would have kingdoms, that would have strong military might and forces behind them. And as a result of the strength of those kingdoms, those nations, the various different kings would emerge and ultimately would give their strength and their support to the Antichrist. But strangely enough, as we have been discussing in the previous two messages and again today, According to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12, and the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have no kingdom as of yet. These kings have no kingdoms. Somehow, however, they reign as kings, though not having kingdoms. So what is their qualifications? Well, one of their clear qualifications, if we are to analyze these kings as what the Bible describes as kings without a kingdom, their incredible wealth. These individuals have incredible wealth and they have technology as one of their primary sources that places them 
in leadership roles in society. Now, I do believe that the interpretation that the kings the Bible speaks of in the last days would in fact come from Western civilization or from the old Roman Empire. But these kings, they have no kingdom. I do believe that this prophecy of the Ten Kings provides for us a huge, huge part of the end time scenario puzzle, if you will. Now, assuming that these ten kings that the Bible speaks about are in fact individuals who we have noted or referred to as oligarchs, and assuming that that interpretation is correct, that they are kings without a kingdom, and these oligarchs, if you will, who we are witnessing, watching, being spoken of through the paid and bought of media, these oligarchs, who are they? And I don't think it's very difficult for us to at least speculate. There are numerous individuals who are influencing substantially not only our nation, but the nations of the world. And they are not tied into any specific nation, as it were. They are free-spirited lone rangers, if you will. What I am attempting to do in this series, first in assuming that these oligarchs, these individuals that we are witnessing on a daily basis being presented to us by the bought and paid for media, that they are in fact the ones that will ultimately give all their resources, their incredible wealth and their technologies into the hands of Antichrist. And what I am attempting to do in this week's and next week's Bible prophecy update, though I realize it is highly speculative, what isn't speculative, however, is that there will be 10 kings that will emerge in the last days, and through that grouping of kings, Antichrist rises. That much we know, that's without speculation. But what we don't know specifically is what the Bible tells us about in Daniel's chapter 7, verse 24, is the individuals who will be removed by Antichrist. If again we look at the interesting characters who are playing a significant role in today's society, and we can say that of them, 10 most certainly are representative of the 10 kings, then the question is, who will, according to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24, be removed by the Antichrist? This is what Daniel 7 and 24 tells us. And the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. Now we're looking at the Antichrist. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Last week, we considered the first one that we might surmise is going to fall into conflict with the Antichrist and disfavor and possibly being dethroned. And that individual was, and you probably have seen the uh, video, the presentation we gave, is the president of Facebook, now referred to called Metaverse, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg himself. This week, I want to speculate on who might be still another of the 10 kings who will be eliminated or dismissed by the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23 tells us this regarding the Antichrist. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, 
that is the Antichrist. And understanding of dark sentences shall stand up. And his very presence will be most intimidating in itself. And so who might be the second speculative individual that will engage in conflict with the Antichrist? I want to present the following oligarch for your consideration. Take a look at this. How's one guy able to do so much? Him because he's one of our great geniuses and we have to protect our genius. This guy's landing rockets. You know, he's landing rockets on, on, you know, robot, robot drone rafts in the ocean. I think what Elon's done with Tesla is fantastic. I think uh, um, Elon's absolutely fixated on going to Mars. And uh, and that is, is almost, I think, is, is his life mission. And, uh, you know, uh, you can respect Elon Musk for his genius, but you have to really respect it because he puts every cent that he has on the line. So you that own guy's a, a winner. You own a Tesla. Absolutely. But, I mean, I what, what about the He's one of our very smart people. They, they said he, he's sleeping on the floor of the Tesla factory mm -hmm. while they're trying to uh, get production they ready. I think that he is, you know, probably the most important um, entrepreneur on the planet. But honestly, after sitting down and talking to him, I, I realized that I'm, I'm now convinced that he's an alien. You know, you see someone like Elon Musk, I mean, the hell do you make of someone like that? You know, I mean, what did he do? He made an electric car, which is basically impossible, and it works, which is basically impossible. And then he built an infrastructure so that you could charge the thing wherever you drove, and that was basically impossible. And then he made it cheap, because if you buy an electric car and you factor in the price of gas, the electric car is actually about as expensive as the gasoline car. And so that was unbelievable. And then he built a bloody rocket, which was one-tenth the price or less that of a NASA rocket that you could reuse, which was impossible. And then he put one of his cars on top of the rocket and he shot it up into space. And then this happened, right? This all happened, and he's still alive. And <laughs> Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a serious transhumanist. And transhumanism is defined as follows. Transhumanism is a philosophical and intellectual movement which advocates the enhancement of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies able to greatly enhance longevity or life, the length of life, mood and cognitive abilities and predicts the emergence of such technologies in the future. And so we note that Elon Musk is in fact a serious transhumanist and that in itself will not conflict with the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, it is a reality, a, a, a concept, if you will, that will undoubtedly be embraced by the Antichrist. What is it about Elon Musk that makes him a likely candidate? Well, once again, we know that he is incredibly wealthy and thus plays a role as one of those supposed oligarchs. In fact, he is considered as being the richest man in the world. There are, however, those who believe there are others in the world who wield trillions of dollars at their disposal, who live in dark places, don't come into the visible eye of society. It may be those that we refer to as Illuminati's or the Freemasons or other secret societies. Nevertheless, Elon Musk on record is noted as being the richest man in the world. He believes in man's destiny is in his own hands. Elon Musk, in that sense, rejects God, and he rejects God's Son. He believes that man must take his own destiny in his hand. 
And that in itself does not conflict with the profile of the Antichrist. But there is something about Elon Musk that may very well earn him the disfavor or even the rage of the Antichrist. Elon Musk believes, at least his public principle, in the well-being of people. He is very different in that he doesn't seem to have the same unprincipled lust for power and security and with the interest of his own self. And, and he seems at, in part to maybe even be concerned about fulfilling his role to society as a leader or as an oligarch, unlike the 10 other kings who are unprincipled. And as you look at these various different individuals who we might consider as one or more of those candidates, they truly seem to have an unbridled zeal for power and prestige and almost a worshiping of society. Elon Musk is different in that, at least based upon what he states, he is creating a technology which we know and refer to as Neuralink, which he believes will help society in, in combating against disease and Cripple, crippling disabilities. Elon Musk has a bold new forecast. The billionaire founder of Tesla and SpaceX said Monday that humans must someday merge with machines in order to avoid becoming obsolete. First human trials of the Neuralink device is going to be an interface between the brain and an electronic device. Neuralink is developing an iOS app that will connect to the link implant through Bluetooth. The app is designed to guide the user through exercises that teach them how to control the iPhone with thought alone. Users would initially learn to control a virtual mouse, then later as they get more practice and Neuralink's adaptive decoding algorithms continue to improve, they expect that users would be able to telepathically control multiple devices including a keyboard or a game controller. And now Elon is telling the world that he expects the brain implant device to enter human trials sometime in the year 2022. A Neuralink, long term, a sophisticated Neuralink could um, put you fully, fully in a virtual reality thing. He believes that utilizing present day technology basically using a combination of machine technology with man, that humanity will better be served. At least that is his stated goal and, and motivation. And in a more futuristic sense, Elon Musk has been noted as stating his serious concern regarding AI and recognizing which many, if not most, who are studying about artificial intelligence see there an intrinsic danger to mankind and that at some given point when AI becomes self-aware and has the ability to outthink humanity trillions of times over, that AI may in fact decide to wipe out humanity itself. And so Elon Musk believes that if we're going to have a fighting chance with that inevitable outcome of artificial intelligence, then we better have the benefit of technology incorporated in our finite, frail beings. In that sense, it seems that maybe Elon Musk amidst all the others that we might consider as the Ten Kings, has something of a tender part in his heart, a genuine concern for society. Now, God only knows the heart. But if in fact this is true, that he has a tender part, tender part in his heart towards humanity, well, that is opposite 
of Antichrist. The Antichrist administration will have no regard or affinity whatsoever toward God's creation. And in fact, that very tenderness in his heart might be his Achilles heel. And so it may be that Elon Musk, as one of the ten kings, now and in the future, reigning without a kingdom, may in fact collide with the diabolical agenda of the Antichrist himself. Where we are heading, which is quite clear, is a post-human world or society. And these oligarchs, if you will, they have an agenda. And make no mistake about it, they state publicly their agenda. Those in the World Economic Forum, the fourth industrial revolution, make very clear their agenda for society. Take a look at this. The fourth industrial revolution is that the innovations we are seeing today in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, advanced robotics, and many others, together constitute a new phase in human development, on par or even exceeding previous industrial revolutions in scale and impact. COVID-19, if anything, has accelerated this ongoing industrial revolution. Thank you, Dr. Schaub. I absolutely agree on the fact that uh, current COVID-19 truly enhanced and accelerated the era of fourth industrial revolution. Here, admittedly, Charles Schwab notes that the pandemic or the pandemic has actually helped accelerate the agenda to build back better, which ultimately shall lead to a post-human society. These individuals want to be as God himself. And their goal is in part, their agenda is clearly transhumanism in essence. Take a look at this. It is essentially seeking the end of humanity as we know it today to evolve into something much better. So if humanity was to get wiped out, that's not an issue because it means we can rebuild ourselves into something greater. Transhumanism is only one part of the puzzle, as once we evolve into something greater, we become post-human and we enter post-humanism. Post-humanism is exceeding the limitations that define less desirable aspects of the human condition. So this includes aging, this includes suffering from disease and death itself. Post-humans would no longer suffer from these problems that plague humanity. This in itself is described as morphological freedom, where humans will have greater physical capability and freedom of form. Post-humanists believe that we will have higher IQ and better cognitive abilities. We will be supercomputers on legs. We will be all of the superheroes from sci-fi movies, basically the greatest that we can ever be. Transhumanism and post-humanism are not really just philosophies. Some would say that they are agendas, that they are part of a greater plan that does indeed want to be achieved. And many people do not realise that this may be taking place. To some, transhumanism sounds wonderful. A life where we can live merged with technology. A life where we are not bound to this earth by disease, by hunger. Our consciousness may even be uploaded to the cloud and we can live forever as a human cyborg of sorts. But let's pick that apart a little bit. The real aims of the transhumanism agenda is essentially manufacturing human evolution, engineering humans, removing divinity itself from humanity. So humanity will outgrow usefulness. The divine will be separated from humans and we will no longer have our natural selves. Humans will become machines. It will be impossible to differentiate between each of us. Scientists themselves will be worshipped like gods for being able to create such technology and develop humanity. They will be seen as saviours, which in itself is 
false worship and idolatry. And the main aim of all of this is to gain more control over the masses themselves. Their agenda holds no place for God or for family. God and family have no part with the agenda that is being pursued aggressively by today's, speculatively speaking, 10 kings. Their purpose and intent is to literally remove the divine, the divinity of God out of humanity once and for all. And so it is safe to assume that these 10 kings, they have an agenda. The handwriting is on the wall. And sooner or later, they are going to accomplish, if God permits, their diabolical scheme. And they are going to together throw in their resources to build up the Antichrist's ability to take control of the entire world. I see no other way of looking at this, but that the Antichrist, when he rises up, will indeed have a turnkey world government operation at his disposal. Unfortunately for Elon Musk, he himself even stating that artificial intelligence is something we need to reject, at least in principle, is what is ultimately going to be a necessary part of his Starlink, which are numerous hundreds of satellites that will bring together the entire world in a ultimate place where maybe man will come to a place of singularity. Next week, we will consider the third and final, speculatively speaking, oligarch or king that will reign without a kingdom and who may very well fall into the disfavor of the Antichrist himself. And we are going to consider the very concept of singularity. We're going to discuss what it means when these philosophers and these scientists and these computer scientists and so forth speak about singularity, that these world humanists, these transhumanists are hoping to ultimately achieve. As we consider the resources that the Antichrist will soon be utilizing through the resources that are going to be brought to bear or to the table by the various different oligarchs and uh, the very instruments by which Antichrist will become a world, the world leader, and ultimately will be call, calling for humanity to worship him. If indeed, we are as close as we are. As we see things unfolding prophetically, as we clearly see, then we would do well to consider these two final closing points that I would like to make. And the first is this, the forces behind the agenda. If we are not careful, we can become absorbed with anger and frustration toward the arm of flesh. And indeed, we see visibly the hand of man, the greed, the, the lust for power, working in society to accomplish a selfish and an evil end agenda. But we would do well to consider this, Ephesians chapter 6, read it in your time, own time, tells us that behind the flesh there is dark looming forces. 
different levels of fallen angels and designated realms of authority. These very beings are ruling and reigning in society through those who hold positions of prominence and world influence. Ephesians 6 clearly states, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, in places where there are reigning kings who for now have no kingdoms. So the first point we would do well in considering is that we are dealing with dark forces. The second point that I would like to consider in closing is this, the trump of God. We know when we see these things beginning to come to pass, the Lord Jesus himself told us, it is time to look up for our redemption is drawing near, even at the door. The time when the Father is either going to take in his own hand or call for a trumpet, the trump of God, to blast, to sound, and at the same time, perhaps simultaneously, instructing his son, son, it is now time to descend into the earth's atmosphere, in the clouds, to call your bride, the church, home. Home, sweet home. Indeed, if we who hold to a pre-tribulation rapture position are correct, and I can see no other explanation for the absence of the church during the seven-year tribulation or the fact that the seven-year tribulation is the time when God once again turns back to Israel and deals with Israel. We call it Jacob's troubles or Daniel's 70th week. The only reasonable explanation, sound doctrine, if you will, is that the church of Jesus Christ must first be taken out of the world before that fourth beast can be revealed, the Antichrist. And so we would do well to consider, one, we see the powers of darkness rising up ready to take literal world control under the auspice of Satan himself. But for the saints, we are seeing the time has come soon. We are going to ascend into the clouds according to John chapter 14, where we read where Jesus himself said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's in my father's house. Look at it. One of the most beautiful portion of Bible prophecy. Friends, the rapture is imminent. And the question is this, are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord in the air and so forever to be with the Lord? If you are ready, hallelujah, you are blessed and rejoicing in hope along with myself and so many others. This is the most wonderful time to be alive, to be a Christian, because we are looking up. The blessed hope which purifies is in full play right now. But if you are not ready, then cheer up. I actually have good news for you. You see, the Bible, which is God's book of prophetic of elements and resources, the inspired Word of God, 
In fact, let me say this. The things we have been sharing alone from this platform, from Sheep Song Ministries, regarding the prophecies, some of which are somewhat ambiguous, others are very, very specific in their description. All of these converging together simply demands a verdict. And that verdict is God's book, the Bible, is real. And that book, the Bible, the inspired word of God, tells us about man's destiny. And it will be one of two places. Every man, every woman, every child ever living in this world will ultimately end up in one of two places. The first place which we talk about with joy is heaven, where the mansions of God prepared for the bride await our homecoming. The blissfulness of joy and peace and celebration and sense of well-being and all the various descriptive terms that we might employ regarding the glory and the wonder of heaven where we will live forever. In fact, there are no real terms that can sufficiently describe the glory of heaven. And we can only imagine from a finite point of view. But I, I want to talk to those of you who are not ready about the other place. Because as sure as the Bible is the Word of God, it teaches us not only about heaven, it also teaches us about the place that was prepared ultimately for the devil and his angels. It's a place called hell. It's a place where all of man's senses are in operation. His smell, his feel, his taste, his cognitive abilities, his ability to sense around him fear. Those sensory mechanisms, the Bible does not only tell us that they will all be in play in hell, it actually tells us that those senses will be in a heightened sense. So that the sense of hopelessness will be intense hopelessness. The sense of fear will be intense fear. The sense of pain and suffering will be intense pain and suffering. It is described in the Bible as being a place that is so horrific that if I did not have God's word to tell me about it, personally, I could not imagine a holy, loving God, as I know our God is, to have prepared a place for any living being to reside. But I'm not God. There are things that I do not understand regarding the economy of God. I can only report the truth. And the truth of the matter is this. Everyone, whether you are an atheist, an agnostic, or a semi-believer, everyone will live forever. We hear about these things from individuals who have out-of-body experiences, and there are books written, multiple books written, and scientific studies taken, researching out the individuals who had these experiences, some of which tell about things they observed that could not have been unless they were there. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. But the good news of the Bible, the good news, is that God does not want you to go to that place. For God so loved the world, that means you. He gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever, that means you, believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. The purpose of God and desire for you is that you be with him for all of eternity. 
but he will not force his will upon you or anyone. God is not interested, interested in creating a kingdom of puppets to pull this string, to pull that string, and this thing happens and that thing happens. God's desire is that we might exercise our free will and choose to receive his unspeakable gift so full of glory, which is the gift of eternal life through his Son. But we must do our part, and that part is as follows. We must confess that we are sinners, and we must believe that God sent his Son to the world to die for our sins. And we must believe that Jesus lived a perfect life and gives to us his righteousness as a gift so that we do not stand before a holy God in our sin and wretchedness. But in his sight, we are righteous and pure and holy by faith. This may be your last time to make this decision. I don't know, only God knows, but I'm going to offer you right now the opportunity to pray with me and pray and mean what you are saying from your heart. And if you mean it, then God will do the rest and your future home will not be in the blazing fire of hell, but in the glory, glorious, majestic place called heaven. Repeat these words after me and mean it. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this day as a sinner. I confess that I am a sinner, that I have sinned terribly against you virtually all of my life. Today I ask you, Lord, Please forgive me. Please apply the shed blood of Jesus upon my life and wash away all my sins. According to your word, I confess Jesus as Lord. I believe you sent him to die for our sins. Furthermore, I believe he rose from the dead for my justification. And so, Lord, I now open my heart and I invite you to come into my life by your Holy Spirit and make me your child from this day forward. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, I want to give you a big hug if I could through the airwaves, congratulating you. You have found the Lord. Now you all know that each week we share a word, a personal word, that I believe God gives to certain individuals who follow this ministry and you support this ministry through prayer and whatever other way. And the Lord has in the past spoken incredible encouraging words to some of you, you know who you are. Today, I wanna share another one of those words for certain ones of you before Danielle and I sing our closing duet. Perhaps you feel like David, Psalm chapter 6 and verse 3 where he said, My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Some of you are sincerely struggling. You are weary. You are wondering if you're even going to be able to make it to the end. You are tired. You've been looking to the Lord to provide for you that which will enable you to finish your course with joy. But nothing's happening. Receive this word this day. 
It is in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall fail and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Now listen to verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You have done everything that you know of in order to hopefully change the way you're feeling and sensing. May I suggest to you, wait on the Lord. Patiently wait. The scripture says, it is good for a man to both hope and to quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The Lord says, he will give you strength. He will enable you to soar like that of an eagle who makes virtually no effort at all to soar in the sky above. So God promises he will give strength to you and my prayer is for you today you who have felt so weary and you love the Lord but you're tired my prayer is that God will take this word this promise contained in this word and maybe while you take some time alone in your prayer closet maybe a few times in your prayer closet God is going to give you strength and encouragement. Remember, the battle isn't yours. The battle, it's the Lord's. And now we are going to close, Danielle and I, with a song. It's an old-fashioned song. In fact, my daughter never heard it before. Some of you will recognize it. Many of you will not. But the words it contains, the truth in its message, it's awesome. May you be blessed as we minister it. And please remember us in prayer and lift up this ministry. We have very little resources. We are not able to do what some of the larger, more established ministries do in order to get the word out. But we're thankful that God has allowed us to do our part as little as it may be but we truly would appreciate your prayerful support in Jesus' name. God bless you. Be blessed as we minister this song. There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's It sends out a light that I might plainly see. And the light that shines in the darkness now, it will safely lead me home. If it wasn't for that lighthouse, Thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him Yes, Jesus is the lighthouse Over the rocks, the rocks of sin And He has shown a light Around me.
Until that moment, Maranatha, my friends, Jesus, he is coming. He is coming soon. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>